Hi everyone, welcome back to chemistry. In this video, we're going to start chapter 9, which is all about solutions. So we've talked about solutions a little bit, or you've heard me mention the word, um, and you've probably seen them if you watch any like medical TV shows or anything like that, or if you've been to a doctor before um, and had to get an IV. Um, one of the uh, most famous or most common IV solutions that uh, patients are given is something like normal saline solution. And this is just a really fast way of saying that we've dissolved nine grams of sodium chloride or NaCl into a liter of solution, uh, usually water. So um, that is a solution, right? We take some substance and we dissolve it in a solution uh, and we make a solution. Physicians can select from lots of other, you know, pre-made IV solutions, um, depending on what a patient actually needs. Uh, but that's just one example. Um, so uh, any solution, that's just our way of saying a uh, homogeneous mixture. And remember I said that homogeneous mixtures are ones that look the same throughout. So there are different parts of the mixture, right? But you can't really see those different parts with your naked eye. Um, we have special terms for the different parts in these homogeneous mixtures or solutions. So the major component of a solution is called the solvent, and that's the thing that we are dissolving something into, usually water. So solvent, we are dissolving uh, something into. The thing we're dissolving something into. The minor component component of the solution is the solute, and that's the thing being dissolved. So in the case of NaCl solution, let's just zoom out a little bit over here. If we have, uh, for example, NaCl solution, the, uh, we take some NaCl, and we dissolve it in, you know, some water. The H2O would be our solvent, right? The thing that we're dissolving something into. And our NaCl would be our solute. Let's actually make those different colors. Make that one blue, and we'll make this one blue. And then the thing that we're left with, the thing that we make is our solution which has those little NaCl crystals dissolved into it. You can't actually see it, um, but that would be our solution. So here's another picture of that. So um, we take our solute, which is the thing that we're trying to dissolve, and we take our solvent, um, usually water or something like that, um, the thing we're dissolving something into, and then we make a solution with both of those things um, in it. Now, typically, um, the solvent is the same phase as the solution itself. So for instance, over here, if water is our solvent, the solution's gonna end up being um, in the liquid phase as well. We start out in the liquid phase and we end up in the liquid phase. And that's just typically because we have so much more of the solvent than the solute. And actually, sometimes that's a good way of thinking about it. The solute is the thing that you have less of, right? and the solvent is the thing you have more of. Um, so some examples of uh, some typical, you know, solvent solutions are uh, given over here. So we've got air. Air is actually a solution. So a lot of times we think of air as just, you know, oxygen, um, but it's not. It's, it's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and all these other uh, gases. Um, carbonated beverages, uh, those are actually also a solution. It's kind of weird to think about, but what are carbonated beverages? Well, we take a liquid and we dissolve some gas in there, CO2, and we get out a carbonated beverage. Okay, so what causes the solution to form? Um, well, the simple way of answering that question is the solvent and the solute the thing we're dissolving uh, stuff into and the thing we're actually dissolving, those have to have similar intermolecular uh, forces and interactions. A, a less fancy way of saying this is like dissolves like. Like dissolves like. So for instance, if we have a solvent that's really polar, right, like water, 
something like water. That solvent is only going to dissolve solutes that are also polar or ionic, right? Remember we said um, on kind of like a scale going from left to right, you've got something that's, you know, pure covalent, right? Sharing electrons evenly, nonpolar. And then in the middle, you've got, you know, like a polar molecule. And then on the right, you've got something that's an ionic compound, right? Going from left to right, we're getting um, more and more and more polar. So you could kind of think of as an ionic compound as extremely, extremely polar, the most polar you can get, right? Um, so as if, if we have a solvent that is polar, if we want to dissolve something into it, it's got to be a polar um, solute. Likewise, if we have a solvent that's nonpolar, that solvent's only going to dissolve nonpolar solutes. So, for example, let's uh, try some of these out. It says determine if water, which is polar, will dissolve the following. So we have CH3OH, which is, um, I've already given it to you, that's a polar molecule. But if you weren't given that, you could figure that out, right? It's just going to take some time. Um, and you would see, okay, well, what atoms do I have? Which ones are more electronegative? How much more electronegative are they? Um, and is it sharing electrons evenly or unevenly? Okay, but I've already told you, so it's a polar molecule. Um, and we want to know, well, will this molecule dissolve in water? Okay, well, we said that water is polar. And we also said that like dissolves like. So if this CH3OH is a polar molecule, sorry, I didn't even finish my sentence there, like dissolves like, um, if this uh, CH3OH, and, and by the way, this is methanol, um, if this methanol is a polar molecule, um, is it going to dissolve in water or no? Yeah, yes, it, it will definitely dissolve in water because it's polar. And so is water. What about bromine, Br2? This one's a nonpolar molecule. Remember we said two nonmetals bonded together. Well, that's definitely a molecule. It's covalent. But these two um, nonmetals happen to be the same thing, right? They're both bromines. So they both want electrons the same amount. So that's going to be a nonpolar molecule. So is this nonpolar molecule going to dissolve in water? No, no. Because um, like dissolves like. So if uh, you put a nonpolar molecule into something that's polar, it's not going to dissolve. This is actually why oil doesn't dissolve in water. Um, oil is nonpolar, and water is polar. So when we try to put oil into water, you'll notice um, not a whole lot of mixing happens, right? Nothing's dissolving. That oil, you can shake it up real good and kind of get it to sort of dissolve a little bit. Um, but if you let that sit on the counter or in your fridge, you'll notice that it, it separates again. Um, so it's not actually dissolving um, because those two are not, uh, they're not like, they don't have the same intermolecular uh, interactions. Okay, um, what about something like KCl? This is an ionic compound. How do I know it's ionic? Well, remember, we've got a metal, right? A metal here bonded with a nonmetal. Okay, so that's ionic. Um, so when we're thinking about how polar an ionic compound is, that's kind of like the most polar uh, you can get. We don't call them polar necessarily. We get give them that special name, ionic. Um, but it's extremely polar. Um, so um, does KCl dissolve in water? Yeah. Yeah, potassium chloride does dissolve in water because they both are polar. So let's put our yes. All right, so, so far I've talked about water as our solvent because uh, we just use water a lot as a solvent, right? We have plenty of it, um, not, not an un unlimited amount, <laughs> right? Um, but plenty of it, and it's pretty readily available, um, somewhat cheap here. Um, so we can use, you know, water as our solvent, but we can also use other things as our solvent. And one of those is benzene. We often use that as a solvent. Um, so will benzene, which is nonpolar, uh, that's a nonpolar molecule, will that dissolve the following? So for an ionic compound, we said that was like, you know, going to dissolve in a polar um, solvent. So that's not going to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. OK, 
okay? Because it's, uh, it's too polar. All right, what about uh, C6H14? That's a non-polar molecule. Um, is that going to dissolve in benzene? Yeah, like dissolves like, yep, non-polar, non-polar. And then what about HCl, hydrochloric acid? Will that dissolve in benzene? No, it's polar, right? So uh, even though these are both non-metals, right, it's a molecule, they're sharing those um, those electrons unevenly though because uh, they both want electrons a different amount. So as a polar molecule, it's not going to dissolve in benzene, which is non-polar. All right, so we have some special terms to kind of describe this phenomena. Um, so we say uh, that uh, if something is soluble, that means that that solute can dissolve in a particular solvent. So soluble, something is soluble when um, it can dissolve in a particular solvent. Something is insoluble if it does not dissolve in a particular solvent. Okay, so soluble versus insoluble. So for example, we would say that sodium chloride is soluble in water. It's an, it's an ionic compound and water is pretty polar. Um, so, you know, it's going to dissolve in water. Um, but it's not, it's insoluble in hexane, which is a nonpolar molecule. Um, so if the solute and the solvent are both liquids and they're both soluble in any proportion, we would use the word miscible miscible and the word immiscible if they're not. So that's just when we have two liquids, right? If your solute and your solvent are both in the liquid state, um, then we can use this special term miscible if they're sol soluble and um, or if they do dissolve and uh, immiscible if they're... So for something like this, right, oil and water, um, you could... I've, I've been saying that they don't dissolve in each other, but you could also say that they're immiscible because uh, they're not dissolving. All right, now there's usually a limit to how much of our solute we can dissolve into some amount of a uh, solvent. And that limit is called the solubility of the solute. Solubility. So how soluble is something is given by the solubility of the solute. So some solutes have a really low solubility, and others are very soluble in many proportions. Um, and these are all temperature dependent. Solubilities all vary with temperature. So we kind of know this instinctually. Um, when you have some kind of, um, say you're drinking iced coffee, and you pour in some um, sugar in the brown packets, the sugar in the raw, you guys know what I'm talking about. So you pour that in, and uh, into your iced coffee, and what's going to happen to that sugar? It's not dissolving super well, right? Like, it, it might after a while, if you kind of let it sit for a minute, um, and if you stir it really vigorously for a while, but gosh, it takes a long time, right? So, yeah, it's soluble, um, but it's not great, right? It, it takes a while. Now, if you, uh, say you had hot coffee, and you add in some of that sugar in the raw, it definitely dissolves a lot better, right? Same substances, coffee and uh, sugar, right? Sugar in the raw. Um, but, but one is dissolving a lot better than the other, and that's because the solubility varies with the temperature. Um, so you can see here, and you don't need to memorize this, but we have some uh, chart with some various solubilities of different substances. Um, so these solubilities are given in um, grams uh, dissolved in 100 mils of water. And that's typically how we'll see solubility kind of um, denoted, grams in 100 mils of water. So for instance, if we take, you know, uh, our benzene, C6H6, um, and we dissolve that in water, it has a solubility value of 0 0.178 grams in 100 mils of H2O. So any higher than this number, and we can't get it to dissolve anymore. But you'll notice that something like sodium chloride down here, right? That's a much higher solubility in water. We can add in 36 grams in 100 mils of water, and all of that NaCl is going to dissolve. Um, and that's because, right, water is polar, NaCl is ionic, so when those NaCl, uh, that, those, that ionic compound goes into water, we can break it up, it dissolves really good in water. 
Um, so lot, a lot higher solubility value than something like our benzene, which is a, a nonpolar molecule that we talked about earlier. So anytime, so for any substance, you can look up the solubility uh, value for these different substances in a chart. And uh, I'll never ask you to memorize this chart here, but I will, uh, I might have it on an exam or something or a, a, a assignment, and I might ask you, hey, how soluble is methane in water? And then you could find the solubility value and let me know. All right, so um, we can also talk about something called saturation when we talk about solutions. So if a solution contains so much solute that its solubility uh, limit has reached, we've added the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in our solution, we call that a saturated solution. Whereas if we haven't added enough solute to reach the solubility limit, in other words, we could add more solute and it would still dissolve, um, that solution is unsaturated. So I want to make a note of that. So saturated, we've added, added max amount of solute. And unsaturated is have not added max amount of solute. Um, now, so there's saturated and there's unsaturated uh, solutions, but there's also supersaturated solutions. And this is where uh, chemists can actually um, kind of use special circumstances to almost like trick the solution into allowing more solute to dissolve than would normally be allowed. Um, or that would normally um, be able to dissolve. <laughs> um, and this is just using these kind of um, special techniques in the lab, um, but we call that solution supersaturated, a supersaturated solution. Um, these are not very stable though, so you have to be really careful when you make these um, because any the teeniest bump uh, to the container can just cause it to uh, recrystallize again and you'd get your solute back. But if you're curious about these supersaturated solutions, I'd encourage you to uh, Google a little bit of how supersaturation is achieved. Um, and there are some kind of interesting demos on YouTube about it. All right, I'll see you in the next video to talk about concentration.